my my personal belief is that you cannot always fully avoid overfitting there there's always a danger of having some overfitting in there which is if someone claims oh i can avoid that to to 100 i would say they're lying <laughs> uh it's very very <laughs> difficult <laughs> maybe a bit harsh uh but but it's actually really 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 difficult to avoid overfitting completely but there's a few things you can do to at least uh you know mitigate it a little bit Welcome to the Algorithmic Advantage. We're here to expand the toolkit of the quant trading community and introduce investors to the many advantages of systematic trading. Our goal is to educate and inspire as we embark on a captivating journey into the vast knowledge and experience of leading portfolio managers and other experts in the field. We hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, please subscribe, leave us a review or even buy us a coffee by the link on the algorithmicadvantage.com. We really appreciate it. Hi traders, welcome back to the Algorithmic Advantage podcast. Of course, my name is Simon and with me is my co-host Rich. G'day Rich, how are you going? G'day Simon, very good. We're really um, loving the podcasting so far. We'd just like to remind you that if you want to help us out, if you could leave us a review on iTunes, that would uh, that would help enormously. We'd love that. Of course, subscribe on, on YouTube. Some of our shows are more visual uh, than others and... Uh, so, but it's across all of those platforms. Uh, today with us, we're uh, privileged to have Dr. Thomas Stark. Um, Tom is, uh, is now a Sydney resident, but with a German background and he's worked globally. I know he's got a PhD in physics, so I'm going to try not to be too afraid of that. Has worked at Oxford University, worked for Rolls-Royce uh, before going on to funds and prop shops. So um, there's lots of really interesting background there, Tom. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Um, real, real pleasure. We're, we're super excited to have this chat with you and, uh, and go in any direction that it, that it may take. We can talk about uh, you know, how you've been progressing your research and trading uh, skills and development over the last decade in particular. Um, but... Uh, Let's just start with a, a fairly brief uh, background just to give people um, a, an overview of how you got into trading and, and what that sort of what those steps were from from physics to engineering and, and so on into trading and uh, and then we'll quickly try and jump into the trading itself. Sure, sure. Well, I, I, uh, I started out as an engineer and, and physicist, so I worked uh, you know in, in some engineering companies like Rolls Royce and also in academia a bit. And um, at some point, I had this crazy idea of why don't I, um, you know, I've never heard, done anything really about stock trading. And I thought, why don't I just build some computer systems that trade on the stock market? And I prop up my, my engineering salary a little bit. <laughs> and um, I basically started looking into this and, yeah, it became quite an obsession. And, you know, I started building, you know, systems and... And at the time, there wasn't really much out there. So, so what I did on the side as well was to uh, have a blog. And so I was one of, at the time, probably about three bloggers on the whole internet uh, talking about this stuff. So um, that was quite a lot of fun, but, but there was a point really where it became so much of an obsession that it actually really interfered with my work. And I had to basically quit my job and just do this full time. And so, at first, you not know, did, did it, <laughs> yes, yeah, so probably not the only one. I was probably an early one. <laughs> that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. So at first I, uh, I did a, a little, you know, a little bit of this on my own and, and I was sort of traveling the world and doing this on the side, basically sitting in cafes and, and programming. And actually I'm probably one of those people that had their first ever trade submitted, uh, in an automated system, so not not necessarily uh, by hand. And, um, you know, as you do that, and also through my blog and the fact that, that people obviously started to get to know me a little bit, you know, I got 
job offers and people say, oh, why don't you come along and help us to build an automated system? We always wanted to do this. And so, I, you know, I worked for various firms, uh, learned a lot in the process, and then finally started my own company, which was mostly consultancy for all types and shapes of firms. The interesting part of doing that was that I really got to see very, very many different aspects of the uh, financial world and, and many different uh, types. And so I'm not uh, too afraid on taking on a challenge and I uh, had a few very interesting challenges over the years. And uh, currently I'm still running my business, but I'm also uh, working with some uh, big uh, family office on their alpha generation. So that's at the moment, my main uh, uh, task, I should say. So, so I'm focusing on that, uh, which is also very interesting uh, for me because it really ramps up uh, my game uh, by really developing strategies that can take some large amounts of uh, funding. Uh, and yeah, so, so this is definitely mm. new challenges there uh, than when you work with a smaller uh, um, with smaller uh, strategies. Yep. Tom, how did you find the transition from physics, the understanding of physical systems, to trading, the understanding of human systems? How, how did you find yeah. that transition? <laughs> That's a good question, actually, because uh, initially I thought, ah, oh, this is going to be really easy, <laughs> and it's not a uh, it's not a problem. And I, I think I think. Um, a lot of people coming from the physics data science background actually think that. But in fact, it was not that easy. Uh, I had to really completely rethink um, a lot of my ideas about the world, I should say. And coming from physics, of course, there are a lot of uh, really similar things. Now, I think what the real difference is, is physics is a really structured subject and you move on in a very structured way whereas finance is really more of an art in my opinion uh, you actually use the tools of mathematics physics and programming so you actually use the scientific tools but the the outcome is is very not deterministic yeah. so it's it's more that that you build that you build something that may work for a while uh, and then it doesn't anymore because it's uh, obviously the financial markets. It, it's almost like you're, you're, a, you're uh, an artist that, that, that builds a piece of art and it's really in fashion for a while and people really want it or a piece of music. And then, and then at some point you're just not popular anymore and you have to like come up with new ideas, dream up something new. You obviously use always the same instruments perhaps or maybe you learn new instruments, but uh, uh, your the work you do is always somewhat uh, temporary. Yeah. While yeah. in physics, once you come up with something, it's it's fairly set in stone. I mean, it's it's not always for eternity, but it's definitely a lot more long lived. So the laws that of in the itself, universe are a little more enduring. Yes. Than the laws yes. Of human behavior, say. That, it, that in itself is actually a really interesting and a real big difference. And in fact, once I moved into finance, I, I found it quite a bit more exciting than physics at the end of the day mm -hmm. because yeah. of that yeah. transient character. It, it just gives, probably suits my character a little bit more. It, it just, just gives more more room for, for play and, 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 and creativity. So fundamentally, you view the markets as sort of over the long term, indeterministic, non-stationary, but over the short term, you see these opportunities that might last sort of ephemeral opportunities, might not last a period of time, but then decay and there's this constant adaption and evolution going on in the markets. Is that how you see this, um, yeah, this absolutely. game we're playing? I think evolution is like a really good word for it because you obviously have a collection of players in the market with all different types of understanding, knowledge, uh, behavior. And, and not only that, 
they are different players with these different understandings, all of them also learn and evolve over time. And so it creates this, this really interesting dynamic, which is hugely nonlinear and it, it changes uh, in, in a sense also in the way that the culture changes, the technology changes and all of this. And then also with respect to each other, because there is this uh, clearly this predator and prey uh, dynamic going on in the markets as well. And so the system becomes incredibly complex and very hard to understand. And in a way, if you really want to participate for a long time, you have to, at least to some extent, stay on top of what's happening. Clearly, there will be people that say, well, the same strategies that worked 15, 20, 50 years ago are still working. And that's true, but there's definitely a change. And if you want to keep your edge, I think it's, it's, it's probably... Uh, safe to say that you definitely have to evolve with the markets. Yeah. You see this in, you know, altering regulations over the time, new trading species coming into the market, like high frequency trading, all of these things, there's this continual Absolutely. sort of um, adaption required for the participants in the market to keep alive and the competitive war that we're playing in this game. Well, I don't see it Rich as a wall, really. Rich likes to call them complex adaptive <laughs> systems. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's not really a war in that sense. I, I think it's, I mean, it is, but but when you look, for example, in in, 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 in the Sydney uh, uh, trading community or the, you know, the, everyone, or the, the, most people know each other. They've all worked together in some firms or the other. And so we're competitors, but we're also friends. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a, I, I would say, you know, it's not always an unfriendly competition. Um, it's, it's, it, yeah, hard, hard to say, mm. but, but it's, it's, it's an interesting one. And, and obviously there's a lot of really smart people with great ideas. And w when someone comes up with a new idea and, and perhaps uh, starts to outperform you, it stimulates your own creativity to, Go one better. <laughs> um, in a so way, it's, it's a war against yourself, isn't it? It's sort it, of a war it, it against is, your own self. It is mm. to some extent. And, so, and so, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I was just going to say that that what's interesting about this is for me, you know, we're, as humans, we have a tendency to always stay with our habits, and and when we have things that that work well, we want to just hold on to them and. I personally sometimes struggle with that to actually then say, well, I want to try something new, but if I really go into a new field, it's really difficult at the beginning, hard to learn. And, and having this, this drive to always push the boundaries, getting out of your comfort zone to try something new, it's not that straightforward, actually. Yeah. Mm. So I don't want to miss on some of the um, evolution of yourself as a trader and the systems that you've been through and, and, and some of that journey, but you've triggered me to want to dive into the, the present moment first, which is um, when you're talking about the complex nature of the markets and the changing nature of, of um, extracting profit from those markets, what's your sort of, uh, what's the general approach today in terms of finding factors or finding alpha or otherwise just making money out of the markets. What's your approach to um, to research and searching for those factors then? So, yeah, it's a very interesting. So I used to, I used to say that uh, alphas should make some economic sense uh, for them to be good. And, and I mean, there's, there's some real truth uh, to that. Specifically, if you are somewhat discretionary, and you, you know, you actually watch the markets and you see what happens. Now, my approach um, has definitely changed. And you probably remember when the book uh, about Jim Simons uh, from Rentec came out and it didn't reveal much about what they're doing, but what it did reveal was that they're really using um, a lot of interesting uh, ideas that are really not obvious or they don't have any obvious economic uh, reasoning behind them, but nevertheless, they are interesting alphas. 
And that leads to, to a concept called micro alphas, really, which means that, that you have effectively a large number of little trading strategies that, that make, you know, that generate somewhat uh, of a, of a, of a PNL or an alpha, as we say, for do, those of you, I, I'm not sure whether your readers are very familiar with the concept, but well, it basically is you try to have all these small strategies that are s hopefully quite uncorrelated and you combine them and, and uh, what you find is that the combined performance of those actually provides you with a much, much uh, better performance than each of these individual strategies. Now, when you do that, uh, yes, there's so a we, lot of we, we'd talk about that in terms of um, we'd talk about that in terms of return streams. So each of these alphas are producing a an uncorrelated return stream in relation to um, yes, the other yes. return streams. So when we consolidate that, um, it produces a, a great portfolio result. That, that's probably how we'd refer to it in our world. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, so for me, I really see them now as as purely mathematical objects that are combined with some sort of mathematical uh, uh, operations. And, and those operations could be just a simple summation or a more complex, say a mean variance optimization process or something something of that nature. Um, and and you, you basically then go, okay, each of these uh, individual alphas has is in nature just quite, a it's, it's basically a mathematical formulation. Um, and those, those mathematical formulations are then combined. And, and the way to see that is almost like you have, a, you have a portfolio of, 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 of products, then you apply this, this mathematical function to them, which is effectively a trading strategy. And this in itself creates a new type of product uh, with certain behaviors. And then you combine quite a few of those uh, together. So it becomes really quite abstract. And what's interesting is, and I had this discussion before, it, you, you, you completely let go of ideas of trend following or mean reversion or any of this. It's just like, okay, we've got a, um, some, some sort of mathematical formulation that has a predictive element to it. It may not be big, but but many of them combined actually lead to very interesting uh, performances. It sounds and, a bit, Tom, as though it's a bit like weather forecasting using ensemble models um, to, you know, predict outcomes of weather, you know, the broad phenomenon of weather over a period of a short period of time, you know, putting together these nonlinear equations together um, that as an ensemble produces output or this outcome is that the sort of thing you're talking about here it it is in a way um i am um, one of the uh, one of this quote unquote uh, uh bibles if you will in um in quantitative finance is grinnold and khan active portfolio management you may have heard of this book and in there they have this famous uh, it's called the golden rule of asset management or, or portfolio management or something it basically says the information ratio, which is effectively the sharp ratio or the, the risk adjusted return equals uh, information coefficient, which is the skill of, of you as a manager or your, your portfolio strategy times the square root of breadth. And the breadth is how broad uh, your, your strategy covers. Some. So, so if, for example, you have a large number of, of products in there or you have a very narrow time frame, like in high frequency trading with lots of trades, that means your breadth increases and then your information coefficient, your skill doesn't have to be very strong and you still uh, uh, generate a good risk adjusted return. Now, unfortunately, my skill as a trader is, is very uh, <laughs> limited, if, if non-existent. So <laughs> <laughs> and so I need to I need to increase my breath to a large extent mm. so I can get away with really small um, information coefficients. And, and, and that, so of course, in itself many, many is a alphas. skill. Yes. So, yeah, lots of different mini alphas all consolidating together. 
Correct. How correct. are you looking for new alphas then, Tom? How are you? Is there um, is there a an AI or a machine learning approach to just harvesting these things while you're asleep at night, or um, are you going in with some ideas and and searching for those in further depth? How are you discovering new uh, factors? Well, um, there's there's a whole. <laughs> I could obviously, I could probably talk about this for for a long um, for a long time. Um, I've actually got a a, mm -hmm. a little course on, okay. on, a, on a platform called Quantinsti on micro alphas. So if anyone's interested, uh, it basically talks about mm -hmm. a lot of how you come up with ideas, how you combine them, how you structure them, and so on. Um, personally, I, I do I do read a lot. I do read read a lot of uh, research, a lot of blogs, uh, YouTube videos, and and one of the things I get ideas from. I never really dismiss an idea. I get ideas from really, um, you know, odd places. And then, for example, oh, I, I actually sources. remember uh, I was I was uh, at 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 the at some traders event one day and, and I was standing there with some other fund managers and this slightly dorky guy came and he, he told us, oh, you guys with all your algorithms, you're so wrong. Just just use this one little thing. I think it was called an engulfing candle and you make a lot of money. And, and you know, mm -hmm. like the other guy, he was actually running a Sydney shop based on uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, hedge fund. And and we were a little bit dismissive of the guy and just smiling. It's like, yeah, all right. But but the next day, I told one of my guys, it's like, oh, just just check out this this hmm. thing and see if it gives us anything. And and lo and behold, it was actually quite interesting. I mean, I don't and I don't tell anyone to use these engulfing candles. Also, but it wasn't hmm. like you couldn't dismiss it. It was statistically significant. Hmm. And I thought, wow, you know. You never know, like like you should never dismiss an idea outright. And what mm. what I do personally is, whenever there is a new idea, I sit down on on my on my uh, laptop, I code it up, uh, I run some tests, and I've done this thousands of times. I've, every time I do it, I'll just code up a quick back test, uh, run the idea through, and and what this also does is it it gives me a discipline of really taking any idea and encoding it up, whatever it is. And so because I've done mm. this to such a large degree, I can now, you know, just sit down and, and even even the strangest ideas, I can probably code up a, a really uh, quick and dirty prototype within an hour or so, no problem. Um, and that would sort of lend itself Tom, to the idea though that you you code up the initial idea and you do expect something to drop out of that fairly quickly before you progress. Uh, you don't expect to um, have to look at that a thousand different ways and run ten thousand different permutations to find something. So, one sense it tells me you are starting with a certain expectation and and you're looking for at least a certain hurdle and then you'll progress. Is that fair? Yeah, yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, interestingly, the 10,000 permutations, if you, if you do, if your codes are really uh, tight, then the 10,000 permutations are actually not that difficult. Uh, if, you know, like mm -hmm. most back tests that, that, that I run, just the dirty ones, the, the quick ones, they run in, in, in a few tens of milliseconds. So, so 10,000 permutations of that are not difficult uh, to achieve anyway. So um, I would say that that just just getting into routine to actually see ideas, whether it's a, a scientific mm -hmm. or a research paper that you found online or a blog, and just really sitting down every time and going, okay, I want to see what's behind that, coding it up, testing it. It's it's a really really good practice, and I think it's a bit like a num. It's really a numbers game, and and. When you do that again and again and again, you, at some point, it's it's a funny thing to say, but but you start to see the light a little bit, or you start to see yeah. similarities. You start to see what happens, and I think most people never really go through that uh, routine. That generally become, I don't know, trend followers or something, and and 
basically take one specific idea and then try to optimize it as much as they can, which is fine. I mean, I'm not dismissing that, but uh, my way was a bit different, trying to basically play the numbers game and getting as many ideas. And then what I also do a lot is combining many ideas, combining um, all types of trend following, uh, pattern recognition, uh, mean reversion, all into one strategy, for example. Um, it's very mm. possible. Tom, um, just, just quickly. So I, I remember when I listened to your um, interview with Aaron Fifield, um, it was about six years ago, I believe. It was. Um, you were talking about your use of alternative data sets to identify alpha or, or factors. Um, yes. So, and then I hear you now talking about the possibility of engulfing candles um, within the price <laughs> data itself. So, uh, when when you're looking at the mix of where you're drawing your ideas from, the data sources, how much would be alternative data sources versus price data? Um, well, at the moment, I'm actually. I moved away from the alternative data sources quite a bit, actually. Uh, this was something I explored uh, for quite a while, and, and there is definitely a lot of uh, opportunities in alternative data sources. The interesting thing is that, that you know, because I am in some sense a bit mathematically minded, I wouldn't call myself by any stretch uh, good at maths or anything, but I still love uh, doing that. and. I quite enjoy the challenge of um, of actually going into it and, and see if I can extract really useful information from really straightforward uh, price uh, series. I actually I actually want to want to give you a little thought experiment. Just imagine um, you take any conceivable trading strategy out there, and and you all uh, you all test them. So, so there could be you know could be anything. Uh, just just uh, think about what could be uh, the expected um, what could be the expected performance out of sample. So you you would you would test, let's say, a million or billion different strategies, and and you obviously get a distribution of performances uh, from each of these strategies. What would actually be uh, the, the, the best uh, uh, performance or, or the, the sort of top uh, percentile that you could expect uh, in in an out of sample uh, uh, test, and it's it's quite interesting because because I've done uh, uh, something along those lines, and the result was quite surprising to me, and and I think um, academically that's that's quite quite an interesting question because it's the question of how much predictiveness can you actually extract from a um, from a historical time series without uh, let's say use uh, any alternative data or insider data uh, at all but but how much how much uh, information can you really extract from historical time series and so so I did I did a little bit of testing along those lines. It's quite fascinating, actually. I haven't got conclusive and answers what did you find, yet, by Tom, the way. Did you find, it, did you find the, it, it a very weak edge uh, that you can exploit, or was it a stronger edge than you anticipated? What was, the, what was the degree of sort of predictability in that historical series? Good good question. So, so what I found was that it varies with the trading frequency that you use. So as the trading yep. frequency increases, the edge does drop off. Um, that's and, and so this is stuff that you know that isn't really scientifically backed up. I would say at this point, at least, I'm planning to maybe write a paper on this, but I haven't yet. Mm -hmm. But what I found was that the edge is actually to some extent lower than I expected. So when I actually look at the distribution of like a large number of strategies. Um, and we're talking at least hundreds of thousands. The 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 actual distribution and and what you see at the tails, especially at the right hand tail, isn't as glamorous as I actually thought. Like I expected, there were some strategies that produce really really high sharp ratios. But surprising to me, it wasn't it wasn't that amazing actually. Um, it's still pretty good, mm. but but. I have a feeling, so this is my, my intuition on that, that there is actually some sort of limit 
of of the performance that you can really expect uh, uh, from from the from the information contained in past time series. I mean, of course, you can in um, in sample you can produce strategies that give you a perfect straight line, but but out of sample, it's a different story, right? Yeah, I think I think this is the implication also that Ed Lorentz found with forecasting weather ahead uh, using you know um, he found that there was a maximum limit of about fourteen days for short term weather forecasts and uh, yes I'd assume that uh, in a way you're probably dealing with this sort of this sort of um, this limit threshold of your your, your forecasting into the future uh, based on your historical. Um, data series and uh, yes, you know, dependent on the frequency you're trading, um, that might extend or contract or whatever. But um, I, I assume that due to the inherent indeterminism of the market, um, there will always be this finite forecasting period uh, that you can't exceed effectively. Um, yes, which means yes. that the edges will always have to be. Um, you, you always have to be continuously looking for new edges, new opportunities based on that, that threshold limit, if you know what I mean. Yes, ex absolutely. And uh, I also, you know, believe that if, if you, which I haven't done, if you look at this over time, you would most likely see that, that the edge over time decays because the markets have become a lot more efficient. So the, uh, specifically the right hand tail is probably going, or also the left hand tail for that matter, because you could technically reverse strategies. Uh, it's, it's probably um, really getting narrower, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. diminishing. So, so it, it really tends towards uh, the, the zero line uh, in, in, the, in the extreme. But of course, that's not the case. I mean, there's still a fairly, you know, a fairly sizable distribution of edges uh, available. Uh, but I, I mean, my guess is over time, they're definitely narrow. Yeah. Tom, I know you... Um use Python and have built your own backtesting engine. I, I assume you do most of your uh, process with your own software there. Is that the case? And have you had any um, use of other retail platforms, say, or even other institutional platforms that um, you've had a good experience with or that, are, uh, that you recommend to people or you actually recommend people start building their own backtesting engines in Python and learning to code in Python? Um that's it's a very philosophical question. Um, <laughs> now, um, <laughs> I personally like the discipline of actually coding everything up myself because it it really makes me, you know, it makes me really go deep into into what I'm actually doing, and also helps me to understand how other people structure their platforms. Obviously, over time, uh, there's been quite an evolution of the way I build my backtests by doing it over and over again. And every time I run a backtest, I, I start from scratch again. I, in Python, I just go import NumPy SMP. I, uh, I do that by, by hand, basically. Um, sometimes I do copy and paste, but hardly ever. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll literally start from scratch. Mm -hmm. Now, it, first of all, it gives me good discipline. And, and secondly, I went through a lot of uh, trading platforms and you know, backtesting platforms, I tried a lot of them and none of them has really been very satisfactory. Why? N not so much because they're not good, but, you know, each each strategy, if you will, has generally some idiosyncrasies in them that make them a special use case or, or there needs to be some sort of special use case. And often adapting a platform to that little idiosyncrasy that you have uh, can take longer than, than just coding it up yourself. So, so a lot of these platforms are really good if you do very standard stuff, but, and this is true for any software, as soon as you want to do something a little bit non-standard, it becomes very difficult. And so in a way I, I feel happier with that, but having said that, I mean, you know, there's, there's clearly a lot of really good uh, platforms around and, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been pretty much through, you know, through an iteration of, I don't know, uh, at least, you know, at least uh, a couple of dozen of them. And 
I would I, I can't really say there is one better than the other because they all do their very specific things and and some are good at some things and other good at other things and I guess everyone needs to find their own their own platform that suits them it's not, it's not always easy or you you just start from scratch that that's uh, you know there's a book called learning python the hard way and I guess <laughs> I, 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 I advocate learning algo trading the hard way, <laughs> mm. uh, but, but Fair enough. you know, having said that I have, you know, I have used, uh, you know, I've been, been quite engaged back in the times when Quantopian was still there and using their uh, back tester quite a bit, uh, but, you know, and, 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 and others, um, and, you know, Obviously, I had clients that, that asked me to build stuff on their platforms. I even built a portfolio management system on MetaTrader, which was quite a challenge. MT4, <laughs> uh, build yeah. complex mm -hmm. stuff on MT4. Um, so, so you know, it's it, you know, it's interesting. It's good to good to understand how these platforms work, and that also obviously helped me quite a bit of doing making my own work a lot better as well. Mm. With all of this, getting to know different systems and, and working with different things over time, different types of strategies, different ways of researching, different tools, different data sources, data sets. Um, have you gravitated toward, uh, you know, this is the art versus the, the science maybe, but have you gravitated towards a certain pool of, um, of things that you'd like the most, say <clears throat> certain contracts or certain timeframes um, certain strategy types? Um, good question. Actually, actually uh, no. I, I, in fact, I'm, I'm really trying hard to be very agnostic and open-minded about this. So I've been, I've been through quite a lot of different things, you know, and, and so, so during my evolution, you know, I started with like really standard equities, uh, trading, and then, uh, got into into options uh, did a lot with uh, futures uh, uh, also for a while dabbled with high frequency trading um, and and you know there's quite a few things and I, I think that that it's nice to have a good understanding of of many different asset classes in a way and they all have their very specific uh, features as you will and it's really important also to dive re reasonably deep in, into into what these asset classes actually do. And once you once you understand a few of them, it also makes it easier um, to see a bigger picture. In in because obviously, if you take uh, equities or stocks, then they are not existing in a in an isolated universe. You know, there is a there is always a flow of 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 uh, funds. Uh, from say commodities into into equities and and out and 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 then options can also have a large impact on the price of equities or the volatility of equities and so on so understanding those dynamics by understanding the underlying products is, is quite important and so so really i mean in terms of of strategies and and products i'm, I'm always trying to be really really as open-minded as i can I have in the past gravitated towards equities a little bit, but I'm really trying to not uh, do that too much. And so I, I feel that it's nice to be really open-minded and, and basically, specifically, if I don't understand something, tackle that head on, and <laughs> go for it. Mm. What about time frames? Sorry, Rich, and then over to you. Yep. What about time frames, um, Tom, just in terms of, are there some time frames that are too short, as in, let's say high frequency or, the non-institutional player to, to bother with? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that it, it's it's an interesting one because uh, you, you've probably seen those papers where uh, the performance of day traders was assessed and they found that 98% of day traders are unprofitable, so, something like that. And that's not a surprise to me because if you're retail and given the commission structure that uh, most brokers have, it's extremely difficult uh, to have an edge in, in that space. 
I don't think it's necessarily the skill of the day traders that is the problem, but but the commissions that that you pay as a as a retail trader are pretty high, and and so finding a profitable edge is statistically very very difficult. Um, and even even when you work in an institutional setting, um, finding prof let, let's say you just have a, a standard execution system, you know, these, um, you know, just uh, whatever standard, you know, whatever uh, institutions use for their execution. It's still sometimes difficult uh, to find profitable edges in even even on a on a daily trading strategy. And if you go uh, to a, a lower granularity than that, if, if you do hours or, or even minutes, you really have to be extremely tight in your execution to actually get profitable strategies. I mean, of course, these statements uh, always have to be taken with a pinch of salt because, you know, some people have like a phenomenal edge that they just found and, and it really doesn't matter whether uh, your execution is good or not. But I would say that statistically speaking over a larger sample set, uh, it, it becomes it becomes increasingly harder and, and not just linearly. I, I think if you if you go below a daily uh, a strategy size, just given the given the commission structure you have to deal with, especially as a retail trader, it becomes very very difficult to be profitable. But again, I'm not saying it's not possible. But there's there's still uh, good edges to be had in, in a longer time frame. So I, I would say that. If you are retail, then then even you know if you have longer trading horizons, it doesn't mean you know you couldn't be profitable. It's probably a higher probability that you will be. Tom, let's now look at um, uh, your process today, where uh, you're, you're getting all of these mini alphas, many different mini alphas, maybe across different um, instruments, um, but you've got all of these mini alphas together. You're putting them together in a portfolio, so. Um, there's two aspects. One is um, you know, how do you what, what what measures do you take for position sizing? Is this something based on you know your information coefficient for each of your alphas, or something that tells you the relative strength of them that determines your optimal position sizing, or do you do an equal weighting across all of your mini alphas, etc., for your portfolio? And then also talk about how you mitigate adverse risk at the portfolio level. Do you use stops? Do you use shifting around of your, your correlation structures in your portfolio? Um, so talk, talk to us about putting these mini alphas together into a portfolio, your position sizing in risk management. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a really important um, point. And I... Um, I actually put out a YouTube video once, which was extremely controversial, where I say, "Oh, don't use stop losses for risk management." <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, I have to, uh, you know, obviously that has to be taken with a pinch of salt because if if that's the best you can do, then then you should definitely, you know, you should definitely use that because that's how you, uh, you know, you need to manage your risk uh, clearly. But statistically speaking, when you use <clears throat> stop losses. For risk management, uh, on on anywhere but the very highest level of of your trading strategies, where everything comes together, then you can show statistically that this will have a, a fairly adverse reaction in your in your um, in your trading performance. So if you take like a, a whole let let's say uh, twenty thousand different trading strategies. And you look at the uh, performance of them in terms of mean and variance, so so the distribution, and then you apply uh, any sort of stop losses. And you know that's what I did, just random stop losses. What actually happens is that your mean, your so your average, uh, uh, let's say your average sharp ratio decreases, it goes down, but the standard deviation of your uh, profits and losses goes up, and so. Uh, those strategies are a lot less uh, controllable, and therefore, it, they they are definitely um, um, less desirable. I would say, and in a way, you can see there's a rationale behind it because 
what you're really doing is when you apply a stop loss, you're actually adding another strategy to it with a more or less arbitrary, uh, with an arbitrary parameter. And I mean, adding parameters to a strategy in itself makes them inherently more unstable. But then this parameter in most cases isn't really a very sophisticated parameter. And and so the strategy is, is chopped rather than letting it run its natural course. And that obviously can cause problems. Now, when you look at it on the on the largest level, let's say you have a whole number of these strategies bundled and then you look at that and, and something really goes badly wrong, you definitely have to have a point where you effectively shut down your strategy. So so you really or shut down everything. So when when all of your basically all of your models combine show that you know your your returns are really on the on the left side of the distribution and they go really a few standard deviations away from what you expect, then you really want to make sure that you you know you're switching off your systems and look what happens. Um, and and you could probably call that a stop loss, basically closing out everything. But you you know I, I would say it's it's worth uh, considering that with some caution. But again, that's my own personal opinion, and I know that other people have very different opinions. So I'm just talking about my own my own experience and. I'm not saying this is how it should be. Um, so I think it's important uh, uh, to to also take the advice from people like Grinold and Khan that and 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 you know uh, for that matter uh, uh, Harry Markowitz, good old Harry Markowitz, who said uh, the only free lunch in in uh, financial markets is diversification. So I would say a diversified. Uh, portfolio is a much much better risk management tool as a stop loss, and so you may as well use the free lunch uh, rather than the very expensive lunch uh, to run your strategies. And diversification is probably uh, one of the best you can have. Yeah, the great thing about diversification is the more you diversify, the smaller the bets that that you have, yeah, and the small bets are probably your best defense in uncertainty as opposed to a possible stop loss which can be you know swept through quite quickly in a in a highly volatile Absolutely. market so so tom your your strategies are obviously looking at um correlations for your your alpha so what do you do during periods of uncertainty or periods of regime shift um, so you mentioned how you might have maximum thresholds where you close the portfolio down or whatever like that. But um, given the degree of uncertainty in it, how frequently are you venturing out into that left tail? Um, and uh, and how do you mitigate? Uh, how do you how do you deal with this process in very uncertain regimes? Um, well, generally you you obviously uh, expect that. That this is a, a rare occurrence, but it does happen, and it's happened to me before. And um, to be honest, it's it's you, you really have to make decisions on a case by case basis. It, there's the, if if your strategy and and you know you've done all your due diligence and everything, and then your strategy nicely ventures off track, <laughs> and you look at it, um, it's it's actually not like. When you really come to that point, there isn't really a, a easy uh, process uh, for that. Obviously, I have my, you know, my my uh, tools in place to make sure this is actually a, a truly unexpected move, and it's not something that I would expect uh, given all the inputs that I've had so far. If it does happen, then there is a point where definitely uh, um, some some manual. Um, so manual decision making has to be applied, and it's it's interesting that, for example, if if again referring back to even to Rentex uh, a book, where even even uh, Jim Simons at some point on his yard uh, when when the strategy started to really decay uh, uh, suggested that you know you sh they, they they should interfere manually, and of course yeah, they they, they, they actually arrive. didn't do that. <laughs> 
and I, I guess that the, the best thing is to always uh, trust your strategies, but of course there are limits to that. So, so there is definitely a limit to, to uh, at when, you know, your, your investors uh, actually tell you, no, this is not acceptable anymore. Are there some principles that you apply to work out model decay and to decide when a strategy should come offline because it is no longer performing as expected? Well, well, there are a few there are a few tools that you can use. So, for example, when you when you look at a strategy, you can, for example, calculate the uh, probability of the increase of your drawdowns over time. So, when you know when you look at at strategies and the drawdowns of strategies, then over time you expect them to to increase. Uh, usually with, with some some something like the square root of time or, or some some similar uh, type of measure and so you can then say well you know obviously that's not a hard and fast rule but you could say well statistically we we expect the drawdown to increase by a specific uh, uh, parameter and if the drawdown um, you know, increases significantly more than that, you can then calculate the probability of of that being still within the uh, expected uh, drawdown that, that you can have of the strategy or if it's if it's way out and if it's way out, then it means probably your, your strategy or your alpha isn't working anymore. So the interesting thing is you can actually uh, do that on an individual alpha level and that will give you uh, an indication of whether your alpha is still useful or not. Now, if you do that on an alpha level, uh, the interesting thing there is that, let's just say you have a platform that runs and, and it uses a lot of alphas and, and you keep monitoring those different individual alphas, you can actually say, well, obviously this is not, this is drawing down too much. Um, it's it's not performing as it should and and if for example uh, uh, that little specific alpha you know it's, it's most likely has only a small contribution to the overall uh, alpha of your whole portfolio you can take it out and 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 replace it with something that looks more promising at that point and um hopefully as you do that uh, as you you do that process you know you keep updating your your beliefs about what the market should be over time and you know you're you're and not is this continual attached adjustment to of your position size is, is there a continual adjustment of your position size according to like are you monitoring your correlations in your portfolio on a day-by-day yeah. -day basis etc and adjusting accordingly yeah i mean personally i don't I, I move completely away from the idea of entries and exits um so a lot of people still work in that paradigm, this is the entry, this is the exit. Um, in in my own my own personal uh, work, I um, all I see is just the portfolios adjusting in size. So you've got portfolios, and the positions are adjusted up and down over time. But there's no entries and exits as such anymore. It's, it's just a continuous change. Portfolio of alphas. In, <laughs> yes, yes. It's just a continuous rebalance. It's just, uh, yeah, you got your 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 products, you got your alphas, and then you got alphas of alphas, so to speak. And and all you see from the outside is just adjustments in 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 position sizes, basically. That that's what it looks like from the outside. So I like that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit like an adaptive system. You know, it's just a one big yep. glorious adaptive system that just evolves. You, you could say that, I suppose. <laughs> What's some of the low-hanging fruit then for a retail trader? So in terms of um, having a portfolio of systems, how many systems can they have and how simple can they be? How could they begin to combine them? I'll just, just go with TikTok, buy low, sell high. Um, low-hanging fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> um, Easy. Done. Or, <laughs> we're going to now. Or you want to, <laughs> or you want to do, you want to make your life hard for yourself and not go with the TikTok guys, and actually <laughs> build something. Well, I I don't think there is actually really a limit to it. It's it's uh, 
it really depends a little bit on on how um, how good your skills are in terms of of programming and and um, you know uh, running building stuff. Now, the, the, I, I guess the tricky part is this. You know, everyone has their own uh, specific skill set, and, and some people come from data science or AI. Some people come purely from trading. Um, some people are like physicists or whatever. And, and you know, each of, each of them has a different uh, skill set. But what we're really dealing with is a very multidisciplinary uh, thing, you know, quantitative trading or, or automated systematic trading is very multidisciplinary. So I guess what you need to do is really once you see your weaknesses, you should start working on your weaknesses and then see if you can balance out your weaknesses with your strength. And then once you do that, I suppose there's not really a limit uh, to, to what you can do. The limit is really just how much time are you able to spend on on what you're doing and how you how you allocate your resources because let's say you say oh you know i want to trade my 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 uh, super fund or my my the money that i make that that's great but if if you're actually doing a really good job most likely someone will probably offer you a really well paid job managing some some other people's money and then you won't have time anymore to really uh, at least, at least not not to that extent to actually uh, trade your own money um, and so on. So, so it's really a question of of where you're at in your in your process. But even if you are a, a retail person, I think there is actually, especially with the technology that we have now, that there's a huge amount of of, of possibilities. I mean, for example, if you know. Um, and I, I just say I'm not affiliated or anything with them, but, but for example, Interactive Brokers offers you an AP, API where you can trade a really wide range of different products. And if you, mm. you know, if if you're if you're good enough, you can build some pretty sophisticated uh, strategies on top of of their API, basically. And you know, there's so how how sophisticated is how, how sophisticated does uh does the most simple strategy have to be like can there be simple strategies or um you know how how many degrees of uh, how, how what degree of complexity is really required to get a robust and working model i don't know i i actually don't know i mean i find that there's people out there that use extremely simple stuff and they they do it very very profitably and it's it's good for them. I mean, they they obviously know something that that other people don't. They have a really good simple edge. Uh, personally, I'm I'm not that smart, so I need to uh, need to find something that that works for me, which is perhaps a little bit more complex. Um, but it's also, and this this is probably a really important part of this. For me, it's more fun to explore that. Because if you even if you have a really profitable edge, and you do it day in day out, it just feels like you're going through the motions. It's like work, mm -hmm. and it could actually become quite boring. <laughs> and and I, mm. you know my my attention span is probably not not as long as some other people's, and um, I'm definitely not someone who likes to work on a kind of conveyor belt. So I always. I always personally like to to come up with new ideas and new challenges uh, rather than mm. doing the same old stuff over and over again. So it's really a lot of it really depends on your personality, I would say. I mean, when you really look at and, and I see this with different traders and, and what they do, it, 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 in, in many cases, it's really a reflection of their personality and of their their way of thinking and and their character even and and obviously their their risk uh, aversity uh, risk friendliness or right. risk mm -hmm. aversion so so really i mean this is the interesting part that 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 building trade stra trading strategies is really just an extension of yourself to some degree as well and and mm. i i really wouldn't even if if you told me oh i've got this amazing edge uh, you should trade it 
I probably look at it and go, yeah, I do it for a while and maybe I get a little bit bored or, or it's too risky and I go, mm, it's not for me. It, it's it's really, you know, my it, it's 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 my personality that determines what runs mm. at the end of the day. Yeah, I think your personality helps you work out what you can validate. Like if it's not in your personality to be able to validate a particular thing as well, then it's not, you're not going to be able to create an edge there. Whereas if you've got the kind of personality to, uh, to persist with and validate something, you know, in, in a, one direction versus another, then that's the direction you should go, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. What, what's actually really important is, and, and a lot of people really dismiss that, and, and I see this over and over again, when um, I get a lot of people contacting me on YouTube, uh, on LinkedIn, and what a lot of people actually say is, oh, can you please tell me what actually is a good strategy? What what should it look like? Um, I'm going, wow, because mm -hmm. they see like a tear sheet from, from their trading platform and it's got all these different numbers and they look at it and like, is this good or is this bad? Is this what I want? And actually <laughs> that there should, I, I don't think there's actually any course out there that teaches people, well, this is actually what you should look out for given your circumstances. Cause each performance report has all these like 20 or 30 different metrics or 50, you could even have 200. And each and, and all these together give you a fingerprint of this specific strategy that you just researched. And what is good for one person is totally inappropriate for another. For example, it makes a huge difference if you have, say, 10 grand uh, disposable money that, that you just want to gamble. Or it's your, uh, I don't know, your 150K superannuation fund. Yeah. Uh, it makes it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. and. What is a good performance for one may absolutely not be a good performance for the other. And I, what I, I tell often people and, yeah, and what I 100%. also did with people who work with me is first, you need to actually be able to read and understand a tear sheet and what it actually tells you. There's so many intricacies uh, reading a tear sheet, you know, even stuff like the difference between your sharp ratio and your Sortino ratio even though they seem to be quite a similar thing, but they can really tell you quite a bit of, of interesting uh, stories. For example, um, if your Sortino ratio is much larger than your Sharp ratio, normally your Sortino should be probably somewhere about the square root of two larger than, than your Sharp ratio. But if there's a big divergence, what what you see is, well, the Sortino is basically um, uh, your 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 expected uh, returns divided by uh, uh, the standard deviation of your uh, negative returns, and so yeah. if the Sortino is a lot larger, that means your 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 negative uh, returns or the standard deviation of them is actually a lot smaller. It means that you actually in your in your strategy you have quite a lot of large upward moves that, that punish the sharp ratio. Beneficial volatility, yes. That's yes. right, but they don't punish your Sortino. And so mm. if you see this, you could say, well, actually, you know, like like I've got a lot of really quite high, large, uh, positive moves. Um, and and that tells you something of, you know, your, you know, maybe maybe having another look at your strategy, what's happening there, you know, what, what you know, why like is that argument. happening? Us trend and, followers often have to say when we, we have fairly low sharp ratios, but uh, what, what you're talking about with, we have beneficial volatility in that sharp ratio, which is penalized. So that's a correct. standard argument we sort of um, lay out when comparing to alternative strategies. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 sometimes there's other met metrics that are actually better at characterizing uh, a strategy like this, like the, the profit factor, you know, when when you have, uh, you know, your average win or average positive returns divide or the sum of your average uh, of your returns divided by the sum of your negative returns. And, and that actually is sometimes can be quite large, which means that maybe your sharp ratio isn't in fact that great. And you know that because of that, it doesn't mean you should dismiss that strategy, for example. So. Let's say let's say you always have these big returns 
in, in, in periods where the market is highly uncertain that could really support other strategies that actually have, you know, more, more of a negative reaction to large market volatility. And so sometimes a lower sharp ratio strategy added to a, a portfolio of strategies can actually have a better effect than if you add another strategy, which also has a high sharp ratio, but is probably more or less uh, similar or correlated uh, to the strategies that you've already got there. And um, mm. so- Are there some other metrics or, or minimum uh, hurdles that you use as a benchmark, you know, a certain minimum expectancy or profit factor or payoff or win rate, things that you gravitate towards, certain minimums that you like to see? Yeah, it really depends on what you're trading. Um, mm. There isn't really, there isn't really minimum values as such, but you know, you want to have uh, at least a decent alpha. You know, if 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 your beta is is pretty high, then then it's usually not very desirable because you know you you may just go uh, long only the underlying products that you're trading. So you want to you want to effectively uh, look that that your alpha is relatively uh, speaking is is good, and then of course the correlations between each of those strategies. So usually, what you do is you just look at a correlation mat matrix between them. You want them to be uh, reasonably low as well. Um, then you know we've got alpha, beta, profit factor. You know, there's a whole lot of other strategies. Uh, a skew and and um, skew of the strategy, uh, uh, other other statistical metrics can be interesting. Of course, the compounded annual return, uh, CAGR. Um, you know, there's a whole lot. I mean, it, it really it really depends when you when you look at all these metrics, and you effectively look at the fingerprint of them to to create a story around that. Uh, other things are, for example, your 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 profit per trade can be an interesting one because if it's quite low compared to the commissions, then maybe uh, the backtest looks quite great, but there's very little room for error in there. Mm. And so, if if your profit per trade is is low, uh, then that's also very dangerous. And and even though everything might look really good, when things change a little bit in the market suddenly all this edge that you've had before drops off quite significantly. So obviously there's this, this in itself is a thing you could talk for, for hours about. Indeed. Tom, just quickly, um, we, we haven't got into it yet, but um, can you tell me what processes you're using these days uh, to avoid overfitting? Mm, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, tricky subject, <laughs> of course. My my personal belief is that you cannot always fully avoid overfitting. There, there's always a danger of having some overfitting in there, which is if someone claims, oh, I can avoid that to, to 100%, I would say they're lying. <laughs> uh, it's very, very deep. <laughs> Maybe a bit harsh. Uh, but But it's actually really, really, really difficult to avoid overfitting completely. But... There's a few things you can do to at least, uh, you know, mitigate it a little bit. And and one that I use quite a bit is what you call system parameter permutation, where you basically, you know, you have a, say, an alpha or a strategy, and then what you do is you you just run it through a large number of parameters, and some of them, you you basically then get a, a in and out of sample performance, and what you really want is no matter what your parameters are, you want a correlation between the in-sample and out-of-sample performance. So if you're, you know, regardless of, regardless of what the parameters are. And so if, if you see that, then it means your strategy uh, past informs the out-of-sample period to some, so there's an information spill. But mm. if this isn't there and, and your, your distribution of, of performances is just a big, round blob <laughs> and and there is no correlation then you know you may pick the best the best result but it's it's highly unlikely that going forward you you will actually get any decent performance out of that strategy so well, 
so what people often do is they they do this optimization you know they grab the best performing strategy or whatever and they but it's not it's not enough to do that i think it's it's really important to see whether that strategy as a concept regardless of the parameters actually has a bearing on 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 what the performance might be going forward so that's that's really that's really important and then of course uh in relation to this the concept of walk forward optimization so if you can if you basically do this and you set your strategy parameters and then you have basically a way of selecting your strategy parameters in a certain you know in a certain algorithmic or systematic way right. you can then yes. basically yep. run that yep. strategy in a in a walk forward setting and and then update your beliefs on the market going forward and of course if if that correlation between uh, out of sample or in sample and out of sample performance holds to some extent then your walk forward uh, backtest or process should also show you a, a, a profitability and that isn't a perfect and Tom, uh, way that, that to avoid any biases process, but that gives you a window that, uh, uh, was that it? walk forward gives you a window where it, does a walk forward process give you a window to tell you how frequently you need to re-optimize the process, etc. cetera? Are you using that sure. as well in your walk forward? Sure. I mean, you need basically a look back window. So it's the, the period of time that you look back and then you need a, a, a window uh, that you step forward in. So, so you have these two windows. And obviously you need to make some decisions on on what these windows are but you know in, in in a sense what that does is it forces you to have a systematic way of determining your system parameters as well rather than picking them manually out of thin air where you go oh yeah i just use this you actually have to say well systematically or oh, you need to put a systematic process in place that does that and and that gives you some discipline, uh, which will come in very handy later. And, and if that walk forward process gives you some decent results, then, then you can have at least some confidence that your strategy will still work going forward. Of course, you've got to be quite careful when you program this. It's very easy still to introduce some really subtle biases. Um, and mm. that can always happen. You know, you probably, you know, I think most people have that happen to, and even even the pros that that I work with, no one's actually uh, immune to sometimes introducing a subtle mm -hmm. bias in, in in the programming, and then you you run, you test stuff for a month or two, and then suddenly you go, oh my god, I just did that, <laughs> and I have to start from scratch again. Mm -hmm. That that is that is always a possibility. And it's it's difficult to go past that. In a in that institutional in that institutional environment, Tom, is there a certain amount of time that uh, a strategy generally has to perform uh, before actually taking it live? Um, it actually really depends on the institution. Um, mostly, I mean, yeah. there's uh, some some places are more like have have more of a of an attitude of uh, if it looks all right. Don't don't fuzz around for too long. Uh, just go for it. And this is a lot with those more um, agile prop trading firms. They're they're rather just mm. giving it a go and see what happens. Uh, but there's other institutions yep. that are a lot more conservative. That you know where it can take a year or even longer to actually get a new strategy online. And there's everything in between. So. Mm. I know of institutions you can get a strategy up and running in a day, um, and there, are, and and all of them are actually pretty profitable. Um, it really depends on the on the culture within the firm, uh, and I, I've worked in 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 all of them basically. So it really depends. There's a very broad spectrum. Mm. And just as we start to wrap up, uh, Tom, talk to us about whether you use AI. Uh, and even if you'd like to talk about quantum computing, where you think maybe we're going with that, but uh, whether you use AI or other, you know, machine learning processes that you might use, especially to help with the overfitting or with the strategy discovery. 
Um, well, AI is really just a tool these days that, that you just plug in. I mean, um, it, it's, it's used just, just quite, or, or you know, they, 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 there's quite extensive uses. Now, the problem with AI as such, uh, and we're talking about neural networks, is always the the very high uh, propensity to overfit because of the large parameters that these systems have. So that is a very big problem, and in over, and in general, it's it's actually difficult uh, to get AI systems being robust enough uh, to overcome that that overfitting problem. There's obviously quite a lot of machine learning tools that have a lot less um, uh, that are a lot less prone to overfitting. Uh, for example, um, you know, obviously linear regression is is like that it just fits linearly but also something like a support vector machine or support vector regression also has probably less uh, of, a, of a probability of overfitting um, and and of course these um, these systems are fairly standard now in a standard use and there's a whole host of them I would say that that you know, most strategies have some element of at least machine learning in there, if not some AI. Now, when it comes to proper use of AI, I would say that um, it, it can it can actually work. So at the moment, I'm actually I'm building a course for uh, Quantra where it's basically a portfolio management using neural networks or AI, uh, actually LSTMs. Um, which is a type of time series based neural network. And, and I show in a course that, that you know, you can really uh, improve on, on your standard uh, mean variance uh, portfolio calculations quite a bit of actually using a, a dynamic time series based uh, calculation of your position sizes. And you can actually make that also quite robust out of sample with a few tweaks. So, Again, this, this this is now, you know, something that can definitely be done. And of course, there is no end in, in using AI systems creatively to achieve that. But it's definitely not easy. And I think, you know, a lot of uh, uh, these days, a lot of uh, data scientists, I think they underestimate the, the financial markets in a sense. Uh, and they think, oh, this is a fairly easy thing to do. I just apply all my knowledge to financial markets. But financial markets operate in a very different way. Um, most um, most systems that data scientists look at, uh, they're what, what uh, uh, Mandelbrot calls a type one chaos. And so they're, they're basically, you know, they're basically systems that don't change over time. And but but financial markets are not the same. Uh, have have you heard of the uh, this notion of the Keynesian beauty contest? It's it's basically the idea no, when you have you have a beauty contest, and let's just say for political correctness, you look at how beautiful, like you have a number of dogs that that you have to rank on how beautiful they are, and so if you have a let's say a big audience and they all have to rank uh, uh, the, the doggies of, of how beautiful they are. What you normally will see is a very stable distribution of your doggies. Um, and so, so, you know, you, you got the, the most attractive one looks like, uh, you know, you got the most votes and then it goes down. But, but this changes completely when you actually ask the audience to tell what everyone else thinks is the most beautiful. So, so if you, instead of voting for the underlying subject, you vote on, on the people who are voting, then you get what's called a type two chaos. And what that means is, is it becomes, extreme, yeah, it, it becomes extremely nonlinear and, and it changes wildly, uh, from, from one session to the next. So let's say you do this in different towns. While if, if you, if you have the type one, it's, it's always going to be similar. The type two suddenly is a com you know changes the result completely from one town to the next, and um, and that's what we're dealing with in financial markets. Well, I've travelled around a few towns difficult. in Australia, and it, it is quite different, I can tell you. But that's <laughs> I believe that <laughs> you know, you know Queensland, New South Wales. Um, so that's 
so that's actually that's actually Hold a really page. big <laughs> that yeah that, that, that's a really big hurdle that 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 uh, the data science uh, scientists often can't c quite comprehend at first when they come into this field and it's something that's easily underestimated so i would say that that you know you got to be quite aware of that when you use those tools so that was I think mm. the first part of your question, that was the second part, which you may have to. Oh, just whether repeat. you had any, anything to, uh, to talk to around, um, quantum computing. Oh, quantum computers. Well, I'm a physicist, so I love the idea of a quantum computer. Now there was, um, you know, many years ago, they, they held quite a bit of promise. And actually in, in 2014, we actually held the world's first, uh, hackathon on quantum computers. <laughs> So it was the idea that, oh yeah, we, you know, we have a lot of smart people coming in and writing uh, code competitively for a quantum computer and see whether they can do it. It was good fun, but um, you know, the expectation that within 10 years, uh, the quantum computers would really be in a, in a sort of general working state that, that people could use them. That still hasn't, it hasn't really materialized just yet, but they do get quite a bit better. And there is definitely some interesting uh, projects uh, coming up. And what people have done already is running very simple um, quantitative finance problems on quantum computers and getting solutions. Now, I would say, you know, the state of, of quantum computers is, you know, like transistors in the 1940s or 50s, you know, you got these big computers with like one kilobyte of memory. And obviously that's not, it's not quite ideal yet. And, and you know, we've got now, I think, is it 500 qubits is the maximum uh, that has been reached. So that's obviously a very small number still, but it keeps getting better and it keeps evolving. And while this is happening, people are already developing some very interesting processes on those, uh, or for those quantum computers. So when they're ready, we've already got the algorithms going uh, to exploit those mm. systems. Now we're not there yet, but but I think we will be. And I think just with normal computer systems, uh, the problem is I don't think anyone can really foresee what is really going to happen uh, with AI. It's, it's so impossible to, to predict. And I mean, you've got Elon Musk uh, predicting some some quite scary things that that you know AI with quantum computers could be you know taking over uh, the humans and and obliterate everything. Who knows? I mean, I'm I'm not a futurist. I have no idea. I mean, I think this is very interesting. Maybe technology. it's all happened before many years ago, and we've actually rebuilt. Quite possibly, who would know? <laughs> you know, Atlantis and so on. Who knows? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, but w yeah, we, we, we don't really know. Um, and it does have a few scary aspects to it. There's no doubt about that, but obviously I'm, I'm, I'm not here and, and I'm, I'm also probably old enough to not worry about that too much. Um, mm. but I think there is definitely a lot of promise in quantum computers and it's an exciting subject. I mean, I have, it has definitely reinvigorated my, uh, my interest in quantum physics again, I've been quite recently sitting down, you know, going through my old books again and, and mm -hmm. actually doing, going back through all the calculations, trying to understand uh, what's happening. There's also interestingly, a few people that use those uh, quantum physics formulations or the, the, the mathematics underpinning quantum physics for financial markets, for example, to find alternative ways of calculating options pricing and so on. Because what they say is that, uh, or the, the argument is that the mathematics is really independent of the idea of quantum physics, just as much as calculus, as it was developed to calculate the uh, trajectory of planets, is not inherent just to uh, 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 astronomy or, or anything like that. But but it's a tool that can be used for pretty much anything. And so that, you could David argue that's the same with quantum. I think, um... <clears throat> What, what is that? David O'Rell. Uh, uh, David O'Rell, um, he's written ah. quite a few books on um, 
the relationship between quantum mechanics and, and price mechanics. And yes. as, as you say, it's not, it's not actually um, saying that price mechanics is quantum mechanical in nature, but it's using principles from quantum mechanics that really help sort of um, explain price discovery a lot better and that sort of thing. So I find that fascinating. Um, correct, correct. And, that, and that Tom, any books that you recommend for people getting into quantum uh, physics to read, um, you know, high level or just to, to, to tantalize the taste buds? Are there any good um, books you've found for the non-mathematician? Well, actually, actually, there's a book by, by a guy called Leonard Susskind, who's been, you know, back, back in the days, he was like working on black holes, like a big opponent of Stephen Hawking. And he wrote... Uh, Book, I think it's called Quantum Physics the limit, the Theoretical the Minimum. Or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it, it? No, actually, actually, that's called the Theoretical Minimum. And it's a really, as much as it is possible, gentle introduction in the mathematics of quantum physics. It's actually a really nice book. It's pretty well written. And it, it really does, you know, if you're mathematically inclined but haven't really touched that subject yet, it gives a nice, gentle introduction if, if, if you're interested. Okay, um, that sounds great. But um, other than that, like you, you mentioned these, the papers of Aurel, I, I think I need to, to go back and actually, actually look at them. Uh, I think there's some interesting things, but this is so far out of, of conventional finance. I mean, <laughs> if, you're, if you're really geeky and you really can't help it, <laughs> then that's something, uh, that's something. But, but I mean, generally, I think if you really want to make money in the markets, it's good to actually stuff with more mundane stuff having said that though i mean even <laughs> even you know when you when you think about that that you know you've got electrons around the nucleus like jumping from one shell to another uh, you could say well prices are not uh for example uh that they're, they're not continuous either you know they jump from one price level to the next yeah, uh, great. Mm -hmm. could could there be could there be something that you know that actually covers that discontinuity or could there be maths that covers the discontinuity in a very effective way? And the first thing you think of as a physicist, oh, maybe quantum physics could be something that actually does that to some extent. But, uh, you know, unfortunately my, my maths isn't, you know, I just follow what other people do, but <laughs> coming up with new things, I'm, I'm not there <laughs> quite yet. So I'll leave that to the academics. Mm. Rich, did you have anything else you'd like to finish on? No, this has been fascinating, Tom, and thank you very much for your time today. Um, sure. I, I, it's been wonderful. You're welcome. Thanks Tom, for is the there great anything questions. we've missed? Um, yeah, about a million things, but that's okay. <laughs> we can't really avoid that. Um, if you <laughs> yeah, well, can there's only think so of much anything. You can do in an, in an yes. hour and a half, isn't there? Exactly. But if you have anything, we can always run another one, another session. That'd be great. We'd love to do great that sometime. Time. And meanwhile, Tom, if people want to get in touch with you, so you mentioned your consulting firm at the beginning. I know that's triple A quants, A A A quants dot com. Yes. Um, if people wanted to get in touch with you, should should we direct them to LinkedIn uh, or any other resources or the links to your uh, training programs that you've mentioned, your educational content? Yeah, I think. I think um, um, LinkedIn is definitely uh, the best way to get in contact with me. Um, then, yeah, I have some some of my uh, some uh, training programs uh, on on my own platform. I also have a number of training programs with uh, Quant Insti, which is uh, a, you know a provider for for quantitative trading education. Uh, there's there's three. There's one on reinforcement learning for trading, uh, one on micro alphas, what we've also discussed, and another one coming up very soon, basically early early 2024, in, in a month or two, on using uh, AI for portfolio management. So uh, there's some interesting stuff there. So quite a lot of what we've discussed is also covered to some extent in in those, or to quite a large extent actually in those uh, programs. I've also got a YouTube channel right. which. I sometimes put out some things that are interesting. And recently I started working with a guy who's a good programmer, but never had any experience in quantitative finance. So I'll basically teach him the beginnings of quantitative finance and in, in, in automated trading and basically just, mm. just put it on, put it on YouTube for, for people so they yes. can get an idea you of do the some process. Python instructional stuff there. 
it's on it's YouTube, not a I've noticed your python instructions yeah it's it's not it's 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 really just a a conversational and and obviously coding uh, thing so it's nothing super slick or anything but i think it's it's got some really very interesting aspects in it uh, so if anyone's interested check it out and what's that channel called again oh it's just dr tom stark yeah i think it's it's yeah. dr tom stark um actually i'm not i'm not e exactly sure what the channel is called <laughs> I think I'm pretty yeah, sure it's Doctor like Tom Star. Another name, um, but I always find it by by that. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you know, if you go, you, you'll probably find it. If you and Google my name, you definitely see. So all the educational stuff, all the educational stuffs on Quantinsty. Otherwise, um, well, well, I've got two. Com. I've got two actually. There's my my. Uh, I've got one that's on Podia as well. Um, Podia. So that's another. What's uh, the, the? Is that Podia.com? Yes, I, I can send you the link, um, and then you've got yeah. Quant Insti as well. So, so there's there's several. Um, okay, just you know, it's just evolved slowly over time with different things, and um, <laughs> so it's a little bit here and there, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, it's not. It's just a side hustle. So yeah. Excellent. Well, people appreciate it. They don't. They love following you. Um, some of your previous programs have got a lot of watches on YouTube. So. Thanks so much, Tom. Yeah, send Thank you. me through all the links to anything that you'd like to for me to include in the show notes, which will be on YouTube or on the, our website as well, so we can link to all of that, uh, a link back to your profile and your material. But, yeah, we'd love to chat with you again sometime down the track, see how you're going. Uh, we wish you all the best with um, the work you're, you're doing at the moment. And, uh, yeah, thanks once again for coming and on. Have a great Christmas, Tom. Same to you. Have a wonderful Christmas. We should remind you that the conversations on this show are informal and for entertainment purposes only. Certainly any general advice you may hear is obviously not specific to your needs, goals or objectives. So nothing discussed on the show should be considered as investment advice. If you want that, you'll need to actually do your own research and speak with your financial advisor. Remember, trading can be extremely risky and past performance is not necessarily indicative of future returns. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe or leave us a review. And if you have any questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Bye for now.